as you're standing in respect and honor of the Word of God, would you turn with me to Matthew chapter 4, verses 18 to 22. Matthew chapter 4, verses 18 to 22. And today, I'm going to be talking in our series called Follow. And uh, as you're turning into the Word, every one of you have lived through life this week. You may have had a good week. You may have had a bad week. You may have had an okay week. But I want you to think about what it's like when you're hungry and you smell your favorite food cooking. There's nothing like the smell of garlic browning in some olive oil for an Italian. It's just wherever it is, I follow that smell and I'm like, there's something good at the other side. And what does it do? An aroma when you're hungry draws you in. I want you to think about the aroma and the presence of Jesus this morning, how it draws you in. And listen, the Bible says, if you're thirsty, come and drink from the Lord. If you're hungry, come and eat from the bread of life. We've all had some interesting weeks here. Maybe some of you are just hanging on by a thread. Maybe some of you are home right now because you're just so exhausted from what life has thrown your way that you're saying, I just, I just need something. I pray the aroma of the Lord, the word of the Lord, the presence of the Lord, the power of the Holy Spirit would draw you in. If you're hungry, God has the spiritual food for you. If you're thirsty, God is going to hydrate you, amen, and bring you life. And if you're empty, God is going to fill you up. So can we lean in this morning as we hear the word of God and we pray, and we talk about what it is to follow the Lord in real time. We talked in the last couple of weeks about people who didn't choose Jesus, people who had something that they couldn't release so they could follow Jesus. Today, I want to concentrate on the disciples and, and, and how they came to Jesus and how they followed him. I want you to understand, I want to preface this. The people who we talked about in Luke chapter 9, the one that says, I got to bury my father, the one that says, I got to, you know, I got to do all these things, those people knew enough about the God, they knew enough about God that they could have made the right choice. But when it comes to the disciples in this moment, at this juncture of their life, I want you to understand they were fishermen. I, my favorite show on TV is Deadliest Catch about Alaska crab fishermen. When I want to quit the ministry, I want to go to, I want to, go to the Bering Sea and want to become a crab fisherman. I want to go on a boat and forget about life. And uh, <laughs> these guys smoking cigarettes, uh, when, th when the waves are 20 feet, you could hear the beeps of the curse words. How many fishermen are rough and tough? These guys knew nothing about the law. They knew nothing about the, the Bible. They knew nothing about the Old Testament. They knew nothing about Moses. Uh, you know, generally, I'm speaking, they were fishermen. This was not their bag. And yet when they came in contact with Jesus, check out what it says. It says, and Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee. He saw two brothers. Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew, and they were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. At once they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John. And they were in a boat with their father, Zebedee, preparing their nets, and Jesus called to them, and immediately they left the boat and their father, and they followed him. I want you to understand, they immediately dropped not only what was in their hands, but was in their peripheral. They dropped what was in their hands, but they also left their security. They dropped what was in their hands, and they also left their source of provision. These people who never really were the pedigree that you would think would follow a rabbi and a religious leader, they dropped everything. Why? Because they saw that Jesus was greater than what they were holding on to or what they were relying upon. And here's the deal, your ability to release anything, not only at salvation, but through sanctification in the journey of your life comes when you understand that Jesus is better than what you're holding on to or what's protecting you and supporting you, amen? How many people know it's not just the aroma of Jesus, it's the reality and the presence of Jesus and it's relationship with Jesus that says Jesus is greater than anything else in this world. That's how you make that choice. You cannot make that decision if who Jesus is is not beautiful to you. So let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for the aroma that will come from your word that will draw people into your presence. We thank you for your Holy Spirit and the tangible power of God that will move in this place. 
we thank you, Lord, for the voice of the Lord that will come through and speak to the heart of every person. For it's not my words that are going to change the heart of people. It is your Holy Spirit, and it's an encounter with you that will bring them to not only a saving faith, but a faith, Lord, that can live through this life abiding with you. I'm just a cracked, broken vessel, God. Speak through me and use me for your glory. And Father, I pray by the end of this time, we'll be closer to you, abiding in you and your word. In Jesus' name, and all of God's people said, amen and amen. Hey, before you see them, why don't you say hi to somebody? Come on, give them a COVID-safe greeting. If they don't have a mask, go and hug them. <laughs> hey, let's take an opportunity to welcome our online congregation. Come on, give them a, give them a big amen. And we encourage you next week, be in the house. Be in the house. Because Pastor Matthew's coming, amen? It's going to be good. Okay, over the last two weeks, we talked about that our ability to release what we hold on to can only come when we're offered something better. So let me, let me just bring it to you this way. Let me re-explain it so this way we're all on the same page. You're holding a $100 bill. And I come with $500 bills, okay? And I say, if you give me that $100 bill, I'm gonna give you these $500 bills. How many of you would hold on to the, now, now it's already been pre-screened that these are legit $100 bills, they're not Fugazis, all right? <laughs> I didn't print them in my basement this morning. Now I'm gonna have the Secret Service after me, all right. <laughs> But how many people know, if somebody, if it was legit, if this was truly everything it was at face value, how many of you would hold on to the $100 and say, I'm okay with the $500? Your ability to release the $100 bill is in the fact that what you're about to receive is of greater value and worth than what you're holding on to. And that's the same principle about being able to release something for Jesus. Whether it's, whether it's to trust him and move forward in the direction, whether it's to, to not do a certain sin, it's that you realize that the value and worth and return on what you're receiving is greater than what you're holding. And here's the crux of this sermon. Until you see Jesus as more valuable and greater than anything that you're holding on to, you will still hold on to it. The problem with the strongholds of our life is that we have not seen Jesus as greater. We don't see him as a better option. We don't see him as a better way. We don't see him as a better source of security. And really that comes down to an issue of two things, trust and pride. So our ability to release what we hold on to can only come when we're offered something better in the person and the reality of Jesus Christ. Now, we also know this, that Jesus will also confront you in the area of your heart that most challenges your commitment to him. And for the last couple of weeks, we focused on those people who said no. I want to talk today about the people who said yes. We realize that Jesus is greater than anything. Amen? But the problem is what we don't release to God because we don't see him. We don't understand his offer. We don't see his plan as greater it really comes down to this. It's an issue of his sovereignty and lordship in our life. It's not just that we don't see him as greater, because I think every one of us, we can see him as greater, but it really comes down to, is he Lord? Is he control of everything? Because how many people know sometimes God is not just going to ask you to release sinful things or things that are dirty and obvious. He's going to ask you to release maybe things that he once gave you, seasons of your life that he gave you, and you're going to have to release it to him like one day. And I say this, one day, I'm not going to be the pastor here. I don't want that to be tomorrow. Some of you do. <laughs> Hurts me that you laughed. And we're going to find out who every one of you are. No, just kidding. <laughs> um, what I'm saying is, in my life, at 28 years old, God blessed me to become the pastor of this church. But there is going to come a time where my season is going to be done. And I'm going to have to release the mantle that's on me and pass the torch to somebody else. That's an example of when God gives you a good thing, but the season is over and now it's time to release it. 
Do you understand the principles the same, whether it's with pornography or it's with even blessing? Whether it's with gossip and control or sinful things or it's things that once were a blessing. And how many people know the blessing also comes in the release. The blessing was the bestowing of, if, I'm using myself as an example. Are you following me here? Because I'm also talking about you. Can you raise your hand if God has blessed you as well in some area of your life with something he's entrusted to you? The very same thing. Most of you have kids. And in the life of a parent, God gives you the blessing of a child. But then there comes that one day when your son's going to call you, Martha, and you're going to say, Mom, I, I met somebody. And, and as long as her name ain't Jezebel, I think we're okay, <laughs> you know? Um, or Amber Her. But anyway, I'm just, I'm sorry. <laughs> Too soon? <laughs> I'm late to the party. I just found out this whole thing was happening. But unless, you, you understand what I'm saying? And it's going to be hard because you're his mom. And nobody can love him like you do. Nobody can hug him like you do. Nobody can soothe his wounds like you do, right? Am I right? Am I right? There's nobody like mom. Not even Shanene, right? <laughs> just let her know. Shanene will never take your place. Come on. Let's do it right now. Let's, have, let's, let's just cut the deal right now. Just look at mom and say she will never take your place. Because <laughs> she can't be your mom. But here's the deal. Moms... You're going to have to let go of those kids. For this reason, a man shall leave his mother and father and be united to his wife, and the two shall become one. And dads, you're going to have to release that girl at 75. <laughs> you see, even the blessings we have to release. It's something I said yesterday, but how do you release it? Because it's hard in the flesh. You're always at war with the flesh. You're always at war with your insecurities. You're always at war with your trust. It, it, it's something that I even deal with. If you think that I'm standing up here and I've got everything all right, I'm going to tell you something. I got trust issues too. I have battles in my heart too. Well, God, if I'm not the pastor, then what am I going to do? He says, trust me, I got you. The latter will be greater than the former. Come on now. You gotta, so how do you get to that point where you can release something instantaneously because it's hard. Come on, how many people, you're ready to release everything right now. No, it's going to take a process. So how do you get to that point that you become ready to, just like the disciples, not just in this moment, but every moment of their life, they were able to release to Jesus what he was asking so that they could proceed to the next level. That's hard. Because if it was easy, churches would be filled and people would be walking in power. But it's one of the things that plagues us the most. We have been conditioned to believe that we have to earn God's love. And so sometimes we see release, listen to me now, as a way of earning God's love. Because we all got daddy and mommy issues. Everyone in this place and everyone online, you all got mommy and daddy issues. Now, you could have grown up with the greatest mother and the greatest father. Your father could have been Mr. Drummond from different strokes, and it could have been amazing, right? But the reality is, is that you all have mommy and daddy issues because somewhere along the line, we all get into this, this system of the fact that my parents will be happy when I do this and when I do that. And I earned their love and their approval. So some, some guys grow up with a father, and it's like in order to be entrusted with something, you spend your life trying to prove to dad, right, that you are trustworthy enough for his approval, his affirmation, and his love. And there's a lot of men, even though your father's not on this earth, you've transferred that that thought and that logic to your heavenly father thinking that in order for God to trust me, in order for God to love me, in order for God to affirm me, I am validated by my works. You are not validated by your works. You are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. And works are a natural byproduct. Works, you know what another word for works is? Fruit. And fruit comes not from earning, but from abiding. Did you catch that? 
Fruit comes from abiding and not earning or trying to prove. And there's some women in this room that whether you had daddy issues or mommy issues, your, ver- your, your worth and, and who you are as a woman and, and your self-esteem is all connected to what you portray, what you put out, what you protect others from seeing. And, and you've, you've transferred that logic to God, thinking that you have to be perfect in his sight and you can't upset and this and this and this. And your, your view of yourself is either up and down based on what you feel God is with. And you have to prove to him that you love him. And you're begging for him to be your provider. And here's the deal. When you abide, you don't have to beg. When you abide, you don't have to position yourself. When you abide, you just have to be. Come on, how many of you ladies before you came to church? You just didn't roll out of bed. You, you made sure you put something on. You probably put on three different outfits before you came. Because you know why? Because you knew you were going to be. Guys, I got news for you. Women don't dress for men. I mean, some of the sleazy ones do in the clubs, but, you know. But generally, post, like once they get their brain back, women don't dress for men. They dress for other women. Am I right? Ladies, come on. Do I got a seat on the view? (laughs) They dress for other women because they know they're going to be judged by other women. Oh, she wore that or, right? How many times, guys, you're standing with your wife and she's talking to one of her friends. Oh, those those shoes are so cute. And you're like, I don't like those shoes. I like the high ones. (laughs) Those ones, you know, they're all right. I don't know why you like them. I like these ones. Yeah. We dress for other people's approval. And if I could just look a certain way, I'll be accepted. But with Jesus, you come just as you are. Because that's the beauty of abiding. You don't have to prove or earn or put on the look. You come just as you are. How many people receive that? Because here's the deal. 1 Samuel 16, 7 was talking about David It says this, let's read it together, the part B. It says, where it says the Lord, right there in the middle, right? If you're from a Long Island, you can say the Lord. All right, here we go. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. This is participatory. I need your help here. Come on now, it's early. Ready? Let's do it again. The Lord. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. The Lord looks at the heart, not your proving. The Lord looks at the heart, not your positioning. The Lord looks at your heart. So you need to understand that Jesus wants you just the way you are. Now, Hebrews 4.13, we're going to read it together. Let's put it up on the screen. Is this blessing somebody this morning? Amen. If it's blessing you online, type in amen. Communicate with each other. This is the church. Connect with the body. Amen. Hebrews 4.13, we're going to read it out loud. And I want you to read it with me. Read it at home too, out loud. The reading of the word of God. Devils flee when the word of God is read out loud. Amen. Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Well, nothing in all creation is his from God's sight. Every, so here's the deal. You're trying to prove to God. You're trying to position yourself for God. You're trying to look for God or whatever your issue is to try and get God's favor. And the word just said, God looks at the heart and nothing is hidden. That means even your motives. You, know, you could hide your motives to me. You could hide your motives to your spouse. You could hide your insecurities to me. You can hide your insecurities to your parents. But when it comes to God, as much as you try, you can't hide. And a lot of people look at that as, oh, no. Because once again, if your view of God is he's some cosmic killjoy waiting to have that gotcha moment with you to make you eternally like a slave or something like that, you got the wrong idea of who God is. My my spiritual father, Pastor Durst, he has this, this uh, amazing understanding of these verses. Uh, really, it's the principle behind it is that when it comes to secret sin or it comes to anything in our life, the fact is everything that is hidden will come out in the light. 
And that's a reality. So understanding that it's going to come out in the light, one of two people will bring it out to the light. Either Satan for your destruction or Jesus for his glory and your benefit. So understanding that it's going to come out whether you like it or not, I would much rather have Jesus deal with it for his glory, my benefit, and the progression of my life than have Satan get it and let it be for my destruction. So knowing that it's going to come out and one or two people are going to get it, abiding in Jesus allows Jesus to deal with the hidden things so that the fruit that comes out will be amazing. Abiding in Jesus is a beautiful thing. It's a restful thing. What does Jesus say in Matthew eleven twenty eight? 28? Come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. There's weariness in this room, and there's weariness online. You can't tell me you're not weary. Gas is $5 a gallon. Meat is like $20 a pound. Fruit, the organic stuff, is like a million dollars for a bushel of bananas from Whole Foods. Everything's going up. But it's not just that everything's going up. The world is upside down. What's good is bad. What's bad is good. It's nuts. And there could be a sense of hopelessness and helplessness. So how do we combat that? We combat that through abiding. Listen, the only word that you obey is the word that you believe. And to believe the word and to trust the word, you have to abide in the word. Notice that in verse 20 of Matthew, right, when we read, it says, at once they left their nets. At once they left what was, they were holding in their hand immediately. And let me ask you something. In this place right now, in every portion of your life, whatever you're holding on to, could you really at once release to God what you're holding on to right now? And I'm not just talking about tangible things. I'm talking, could you, I haven't done this in a while, but since you don't have no mask on, that means you're okay, right? Okay, some people are looking nervous. I'm going to come right here. I'm not just talking about releasing goods. I'm talking about releasing hurts, releasing pains, releasing fears, releasing insecurities, Releasing ideology, releasing the things that have influenced you and the things that have held. If Jesus was in front of you right now, which he is, and he says, would you drop it? You see, the, the, the disciples were asked to drop what was in their hands right now. And let me ask you something. What do you, what do you have in your hands right now? What are you controlling right now? What have you, what have you, what have you put in your hands Because what they had in their hands was bringing them income. It was bringing them resources. So they not only dropped what was in their hands, but they also left their boat and they left their family to follow him. So they were not just dropping what was immediately in their hands. They were also dropping their safety net, their security, their income, and their source. They left the boat. They didn't say, oh, let's hold it onto a trailer and get some mules to carry it all around, Nazareth and Israel, you know. No, they left it and they left their father. They left their comfort zone. They left their food. They left their beds. Why? Because what was offered to them was more beautiful, more better, and more sustaining. They realized because of the presence of God that was standing right in front of them, that they didn't have to worry about provision because provision was standing right in front of them. They didn't have to worry about house because their home was standing right in front of them. They didn't have to worry about comfort because their comfort was standing right in front of them. They didn't have to worry about peace because their peace was standing right in front of them. They didn't have to worry about acceptance because their acceptance was standing right in front of them. And I'm saying that to you right now, just like it was on the sea, right there on the lake. He's standing in front of you. It's okay to release it because he's better. He's more reliable. And he's always on time. So the truth is you cannot hear the voice of God. I want you to write this down. I cannot hear the voice of God. I can't understand the will of God. I cannot see the value of God. So remember, voice will value. I cannot hear the voice of God. I cannot understand the will of God. 
I cannot see the value of God. And the last thing, I cannot discern his direction or the times without abiding in his word. You can't hear the voice of God. You can't understand the will of God. You cannot understand and see the value of God. You cannot discern the times or the will of God unless you abide in him and his word. Abide in him and his word. Abide in him and his word. I want to preface these comments by what abide means. Abide means to live in. And when you live in something, that's how you know someone. I know my wife because I live with my wife. I know my kids because I live with my kids. I know my friends who are on the staff with me because we have worked together for over 20 years. We really know each other. They tell me when I get angry, my nostrils flare. I've never seen it because I can't see the underneath of my nose. You would think how big it is, I, you know, anyway, but <laughs> they know me, and guess what? I know them. I know when they're not exactly happy either. It works both ways, and the only way we can know that is because we spend time together. And when I say abide, I want you to understand abide means that you, you understand and you know someone because you are living with them continually. And to abide with Jesus is not just to check in at church. To abide with Jesus is not just to do a devotion in the morning. To abide with Jesus is to immerse yourself in him and include him in every area and compartment of your life. I'm going to read the scripture. I'm going to give you another illustration of abiding. But let's read it together. John chapter 15, verse 4. Are you ready to read it? It says, remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. Now, verse 17, I'm going to need you all to come in strong with me now. Let's finish. We're going to bring it home. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. If you want to show yourself as a disciple of Jesus, you cannot be a disciple and a follower of Christ unless you remain. And some of you think that being disciples is a, is a selective thing. It's only for some. It's not for all. I'm not going to be one of those disciple Christians. I'm just going to be one of those other Christians who just come to church and make sure that Jesus is my protection and I'll put the little sacred heart guy on the front core, on the front of my car so I don't get any car accidents and I'll just pray that he blesses my house but I'm, I'm not called to be a disciple, you see. I'm just called to be one of those, you know, people who sit in the stands and cheer Jesus on. No, no, no. There is no, if you follow Jesus, you're a disciple. You're either hot or cold. You're not lukewarm. Because in the kingdom, there is no room for in between. But understand, you don't become a disciple by trying to prove to Jesus how disciple-esque you are. You become a disciple by laying down your pride and your necessity to try and prove your Christianity to him or the rest of the world. Because maybe you're not trying to prove it to God. Oh, but you're trying to prove it to everyone else around you. Back in the 80s and 90s, we used to have our floppy Bibles with the cheat tabs on them. And if you're really high class, you had the indentations inside the Bible all cut out. Oh, and you real hardcore Pentecostal people, all the ladies traveled around with a little personal bottle of Goya anointing oil. And the rest of you all just came with your Bible and your little Bible briefcase, right? Come on. And, and you know, you used to prove how holy you were by putting all the church bulletins in there. And when it opened up, 17 church bulletins fell out because you just, you just remember the day. Oh, you remember the day. And what do we do? We, we, virtual, we virtue signal to the world how saved we are. Aren't you glad that don't exist today? Yeah, it does. So-and-so shared a Bible plan. So-and-so liked your verse. And look at you. Beep, 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 beep. 
How many people know the times have changed, the technology has changed, but we all try and signal to everybody else that we okay, right? That we're Christian. The proof of your discipleship is not in your accessorizing. The proof of your discipleship and really the lordship of Jesus Christ in your life is in your ability to abide and rest in him. And then what comes naturally out of abiding is fruit. Fruit is the natural byproduct of abiding. And the fruit, now here's the problem. I'm a fruit tree. I'm at abiding. Spring comes. Start to bud some leaves. Now I've got fruit coming off all these branches in the summer. October, it's harvest time. Now everybody's going to come and pick me. When's the last time you've been to an apple orchard? And you see one of these apple trees just uproot and just in the corner. Oh, this is good. Isn't my fruit good? <laughs> oh, isn't my fruit good? It's great. <laughs> no. That is the weirdest. I would run from that apple orchard. I would be speaking in tongues the whole time. The fruit ain't for you, boo. The fruit's for others. The purpose of abiding and the purpose of your fruit is that as a disciple, a disciple naturally feeds others. Jesus said in Philippians, you should not look to your own interests. I mean, Paul said about Jesus, you should look to your, not only to your own interests, but the interests of others. And that you should be a servant and consider others better than yourselves. And the fruit of a disciple is that they have abided. The proof of a discipleship is an abiding, trusting relationship with Jesus Christ. And in order to abide, you got to trust that the time that you abide, God is taking care of the world that's spinning and some of you haven't rested and some of you haven't abided because you're so worried about your circumstance and trying to help God out listen he's spinning the world on its axis without your help he's making sure the sun comes up in the morning without your help he makes sure the grass gets green and fed without your help he makes sure the birds are fed without your help. He don't need your help for nothing. What he needs is your heart. And he needs your trust. Your trust that you could say, God, this is your church. This is your house. This is your family. And I am yours. And I rest and abide in you. You can't know the voice of God unless you abide in his word. Here's a practical illustration. My father was a New York City transit police officer for 22 years. Before the transit police merged with the NYPD, there were two separate units. The transit police were responsible for all the subways of New York City. And for 22 years, from 1969, 1970, until 1992, 93, my father, every day, except his off days, was in a subway station or a subway car. When COVID hit, he said, I don't know if I'm going to get this, because I breathe so much from the subways, I think I'm immune to just about everything. When my father goes in the subways, the names of the lines can change. The names of the trains can change, but because my father was abiding in the subway for 22 years, you can change the name of the train, but he still knows where the tunnels go to. He knows every platform. He knows where the bathrooms are on the platform. He knows where the precinct is, Transit District 4. One day, he took me there as a kid, and he put me in a holding cell. I was the first five-year-old in New York City to be locked up. <laughs> When my son was young and he was five, he took him down to District 4 and he's got a picture of him in the holding cell. Sometimes I wish we could put him in there again. When I go to the subway, I know the F train, I know the N train, I know the R train, I know the L, I know the 1, 2, and 3. I don't really know the 7 train because I drive to Shea or City Field. I really don't know the train that goes by Yankee Stadium because why would I ever need to go there? <laughs> I 
And when I go into the city and I got to go someplace I've never been, my general time in the subways, I only go when I have to. Some of you go by necessity because you have to work there. But if I really want to know where I'm going, I got to call somebody who's been in there, who's abided in there, for lack of a better word. And I called my dad, and, and it was at the time when they changed one of the lines. He says, yeah, but you're in the same tunnel. So if you go to this one, you go to the IRT, uptown, you go da 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 and you'll be there. I'm like, this man knows, like, did he, like, roam the tunnels, like, at night? I mean, he knows every tunnel. But do you know why he knows every tunnel? Because he has the knowledge of the tunnels because he's, he's abided in the tunnels, right? So then when it comes to the Word of God, let's read verse 7 again. The only way that you can have a knowledge of God and a knowledge of the things of God and a discernment of the voice of God and the direction of God is verse 7. If you remain in me and my words remain in you. Did you catch that? What makes you think you're going to be able to hear the voice of God without remaining in the word? What makes you think you're going to be able to combat the darkness of the enemy without remaining in the word? When Jesus was tempted in the wilderness and the enemy came at him, he came, Jesus came back not with power, didn't come back with lightning, didn't call legions of angels. He defeated the enemy with the word of God. Man cannot live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. You cannot have spiritual victory without knowledge of the word. The word of God is a shield. And you got to believe that it's not just when the enemy attacks you, but the greatest area that he attacks you is somebody with me this morning. The greatest way that he attacks you is in your mind. And the Bible said that the word is a shield. The shield of faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word. The word brings faith. So if faith is a shield, you got to understand, when the word of the enemy comes, you're not enough. You really think God will forgive you for that sin? Put up the shield of faith, which is saturated with the word of God, that when the flaming arrows of the enemy come, the saturation of the water in the leather of the shield will extinguish the flaming arrows. When the word of God says... There is no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. He'll never forgive you. If I confess my sins, he is faithful and just to forgive me of my sins and cleanse me of all unrighteousness. He'll never heal you. By his stripes, I am healed. The prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. He'll never save your marriage. What God has joined together, let no man separate. Come on now. You understand what I'm saying? Right? The word of God. If you don't know the word of God, you will never be able to combat the lies of the enemy. He has given you his word. And the word, you must abide in the word so that the word saturates your soul. Now, I'm going to share something with you that is going to further back up this point. And of course, I'm relying on technology to be readily accessible to prove this point. I want you to write these things down because this is important. The source of this research is by Barna, a research organization that does scholarly research around the world. So this ain't my opinion. This isn't a bunch of people doing a straw poll. This is scholarly, peer-reviewed research presented by Barna and the Bible Engagement Project. And it says this. I want you to write this down. These are four facts about people who read the Bible four times a week. Four times a week, okay? Four times a week. Now, don't get ahead of me. Everybody's getting excited here. Okay. Number one, okay, in order. All right, here's the first one. You are 228% more likely to share your faith. When you have contact with the Word of God four times a week. Now, what does contact mean? Let me rewind and preface what contact means. It does not mean reading for credit. Where you speed read through, it means slowing down and taking the Word of God and, and just meditating on it and studying. Listen, 
I would rather do one New Testament reading, one Psalm and one Proverb, and take my time and take 15 to 20 minutes to absorb that into my spirit than to do an Old Testament, a New Testament, a Psalm, a Proverb, a this and a that. You understand what I'm saying? If that's too much for you, and you, if you're not absorbing it, it's like water off a duck's back. I'd rather hit the brakes. How many people know? When you're speeding, you can't see anything. But when you take it slow, laid back, with my mind on my Jesus and my Jesus on my mind. <laughs> oh, you got that. Okay. <laughs> when you slow down, you can see more. You can absorb more. You can know more. And in abiding, abiding is slowing down. Abiding is not just, okay, God, I'm abiding, I'm abiding, I'm abiding, I'm here, what do you want to do, what do you want to do, come on, you want to talk, you want to talk, you want to talk, come on, come on, come on, come on. It's like my wife trying to talk to me in the middle of the Mets game, she's like, can we talk? I was like, yeah, sure, what do you want to talk about? We got the commercial break, let's talk right now, let's talk right now, because Pete Alonso's up next to me, come on, come on, we want to talk, no, I really want to talk right now. I was like, now's not really a good time to talk, he's coming up with the bases loaded, the pitching change, and the Mets are going to win, I really, can we talk after the game? I want to talk now. Abiding is putting aside the distractions, realizing that you'll have to watch the game and review. And trading Pete Alonzo, who may strike out, may fly out. And Lord knows I hung with the Mets until the eighth inning, and they, not even Jesus can resurrect them from the dead. They lost. It means trading what you think you need for something better. And the only way you realize who Jesus is is by abiding. You smell the fragrance and the beauty of who he is. And... The Word of God says that when we, when we read His Word, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word. So when we slow down, we are tasting and we are nourishing ourselves on the Word of God. We are studying the Word. Study the Word. Study the Word. Study the Word. You have no excuse. There is so much available to you online. Do you realize when I used to prepare sermons before the internet, I used to have to open up a big concordance to find out where the scripture was in reference to the word I was thinking of? Do you know I don't even use the concordances anymore or the cross reference? You know what I got to do is hit Google, go down to Bible Hub, and I will have 15 different commentaries that I could read. I don't need to take Hebrew or Greek anymore because I could look at the word, hit the little thing. And it will tell me the meaning of the Greek and Hebrew word. You don't have to spend thousands of dollars to go to school. It's there for free. And when you have, listen to me now, when you have a state senator from Hawaii that stands up on the floor of whatever legislator he stood up and he said, Jesus said nothing about a certain sin. And then he was silent. Listen, do you take your medical advice from the guy in the street selling peanuts? then why are you taking your, your theological advice from a congressperson? The Bible says, now if Jesus didn't say anything about it, here's the theology of it. Jesus said, I and the Father are one. I do not speak unless the Father gives me permission to speak. I only say what the Father gives me permission to share. And when you detach Jesus and you say, Jesus never said anything about that, you detach him from the Trinity. For he is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And he does not go in disagreement with God, but they are three in one. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are in agreement. And what God calls sin, the Son calls sin, the Holy Spirit calls sin. There's not one that acts separate from the other. And in addition to that, when we abide, we can discern that that's not right because we've studied the Word. And when the Bible says when you touch the Word and you study the Word, you are 228% more likely to share your faith. Do you realize statistics show us that most born-again Christians will not lead one person to Jesus in their life? In their life. But when the Word of God is in you, it lights a fire to see people not through your own eyes, but through the eyes of Jesus. Amen? The second thing is this. You are 407% more likely to memorize Scripture. 
you've got to memorize scripture. I will hide his word in my heart that I may not sin against God. Your word is a unto my feet and a light unto my path. You're 407% more likely to memorize scripture. The next one, you are 59% less likely to view pornography. And everyone's going to be silent on this, but here's the deal. It's the elephant in the room. We live in a hyper-sexualized culture of which sex is readily available to everyone, including your teenagers and your children. And once it hits you, it sears your brain. It changes the chemistry of your brain to react in a certain way. And for those of you who think it's just a men's only problem, <laughs> I got news for you. There's a reason why they had a television show called Sex in the City, and there's a reason why they made some movies called Fifty Shades of G-Ray. And there's a reason why in Maverick they got some oiled up, half-naked men playing football on the, on the, on the beach. And it is illegal that Tom Cruise at like 85 years old looks like that. It's all fake and CGI. And all you ladies, it's Botox. He looks like this off camera. Take my breath away. <laughs> but seriously, it's not just a man problem. It's a woman problem. It's just manifests in different ways. Men are into the vision. Women are into the fantasy. Men are into the vision, women into the feeling. There's a reason why they write romance novels, because it speaks to the emotions of a woman. It could be emotional attachment. And when the word of God is in you and you're memorizing scripture and you're touching it four times a week, you start to experience the aroma of Jesus. So how many of you, how many of you cook curry in your house? And how many people know when you cook curry in your house, it's a dangerous thing? Because everything smells like curry for a while, right? You move in a couch seven years later, things smells like it's an Indian buffet. <laughs> Kerala kitchen coming out the window. <laughs> when we were growing up, my mother, we were, we were Catholic, and on Fridays, we didn't have fish. We, so we didn't have meat. So we would have pizza on Fridays. But when my parents didn't want to do pizza, well, the money was tight, my mother gravitated to making fish. Could you imagine what it's like to come home as a six-year-old, a seven-year-old from school, mom, what's for dinner tonight? Flounder. Scrod. What six-year-old knows what scrod is? It just sounds like a curse word. And when my mother would broil that fish, everything smelt like fish. Your winter jacket smelt like fish. You go down to the key food and you smell like low tide. How many people know what I'm talking about? You ever cook something in your house and you smell like it three days later and it doesn't smell like it was freshly cooked, you know what I mean? You smell like the seas have receded. Why do your clothes smell like that? You smell like that because you have been abiding in the presence of the aroma of that food. Have you ever hugged somebody that's got a nice cologne on and it just sticks on you? And you just, like when my wife... When, you know, sometimes if she gets up before me, uh, she's got a perfume on, you know, and, and I just, I roll on her side because my side smells like old man and, you know, weird stuff. Her pillow smells like perfume. It smells like nice woman smell, you know, and I'm just like, <sighs> and when I smell that, I'm so glad she's my wife. I'm so glad I got a wife that smells good in the morning because how many people know some wives don't smell good in the morning? <laughs> Good morning, would you, would you like some coffee? <laughs> but how many, how many people glad your wife smells better than everybody else's wife? And when I smell the aroma, because we've abided in that room together, there's nothing like it. 
when you are reminded of the aroma and the presence of Jesus through his word, the next time you see something on the screen or you feel the need to click or your mind goes in a certain place, it is easier for your eyes to bounce and your thumbs and your pointers to go someplace else when you realize, remember, the disciples dropped what they were dropping in their hands because they saw something that was better. When you are abide in the word of God, the aroma and the beauty of Jesus comes face to face with the reality of the dream that you are looking at on the screen, and you can drop what's on the screen for what is greater because you're living in the word, and the word is all over you, and you smell and you embrace the aroma of the word. Do you understand the words that are coming out of my mouth? And it ain't just porn. It's gossip. Because what really is gossip? What really is gossip is me trying to do a preemptive strike and a smear campaign against somebody else because of my own insecurities that they'll get me first. And I could drop gossip because I realize that through the word, the Lord is my protector. What can man do to me? He prepares a table before me in the presence of my enemy. The word prevents me from getting vengeance. The word allows me to be still and know that he is God. The word lets me know that this is how I fight my battles. If you're not abiding in his word, you can't hear his voice. And when you abide in his word, the Holy Spirit that penned the word that wrote the word begins to speak to you. Romans 10, 17 says, consequently, faith comes by hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word of Christ. Listen to this. When you have four points of contact in the word a week, you ready? I think this is the last one. You are 30% less likely to struggle with loneliness. And every one of you know what that feels like. You're not going to admit it publicly because we viewed loneliness as a sign of weakness. When somebody stands at the window, all oh, by myself, loneliness. In the pandemic, mental health. And mental health issues are one of the biggest epidemics that is going to hit this country in the post-pandemic world. And the church needs to be ready. We need to be ready. And we need to be ready with the word of God and people who are fitted with the word of God and the gospel of peace who are ready to be hope to people who are hopeless. But here's the deal. David had a guy named Jonathan. When Saul was looking to kill him, Jonathan was an incredible source. David had to run and hide in caves. The future anointed king of Israel had to run from Saul, a crazed king who had lost the anointing. And he would run and hide in caves. And, 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 and it was Saul's son, Jonathan, that came along with him and comforted David and got him through that time. And here's the problem with loneliness. Loneliness is a byproduct of the fact that you have not made God your primary source. Loneliness is a byproduct of the sign that you have not made abiding in Jesus your primary function. You have used your Jonathans to feed your need for fellowship. But the problem is, Jonathan eventually died. How did David understand God? It's because he had a primary relationship of abiding in God. And here's the deal. When you have a primary relationship of abiding in God, he'll send you Jonathans. He'll send you Kevins. He'll send you Lukes. He'll send you Gabes. He'll send you Lises. He'll send, he'll send you Mindas. You understand what I'm saying? David was in the fields. And the Bible said that when Samuel came to the house of Jesse, he said, where are your sons? Because I'm looking for the next king of Israel. 
And David was minimized because he was the youngest, and he was sent out to tend to his father's sheep. And when, when, when Samuel looked at every one of the brothers, he said, no, not this one, not this one, not this one, not this one, not this one. Is there anyone else? And Jesse said, yeah, there's another one, but he's the young one. He's got a booger wall on his, on his, on his, in his room. He's odd. Some of you had that, you know, and you're not laughing because that's you. He's different. He's the youngest. David was minimized. And here's the deal. What does the Bible say? Usually people who are minimized are depressed because they have no friends. He had no support from his family, no support from his father. And what does the Bible say about David? That when he was out in the fields, he would have his harp and he would sing to the Lord. For the Lord does not look at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. And David was a man after God's own heart. And here's the deal. David understood that his strength came from the private time, the alone time, the abiding time. That when everybody else rejected him, his primary source of comfort was God. And when God is your primary source of comfort, then he'll send the Jonathans. Then he'll send the Kevins. Then he'll send the Aarons and the Hers. But if, 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 if the people are your primary source, here's the deal. Jonathan's a spiritual son, but he's got a family. He can't always be there to encourage me over the fruit of my ministry over the years. Pastor Kevin is my best friend on the planet Earth next to Rachel. He's my work wife. Like Doug and Deacon from the King of Queens. But he's got a wife. He's got two kids. His life has changed. When he was single, Kevin, and I was newly married Dom, Rachel would fall asleep at like 11 o'clock. The kids would be sleeping. Pastor Kevin lived above me. I'd hear him walking around in his brown slippers, feeding his plants, eating his salmon. It'd be 2 o'clock in the morning. He'd be up. I'd be up. He'd be like, oh, bro, I can't sleep. He's like, neither can I. He's like, yeah, you want to play some... Uh, PlayStation 2? Yeah, we're old. <laughs> we even played Contra one day. It was great. We beat it. We beat the whole thing in one night. Of course, with the code, up, up, down, down, left, right, left, right, BA, select, start. Oh, don't act like you don't know that. Come on. How many people remember the Contra code for 30 men? That's right. The rest of you need to go and do some research. But, but I will tell you this. 2 o'clock in the morning, Kev, don't exist anymore. He's like, he's like 11.45, 12 o'clock, Kevin, that falls asleep on the recliner. <laughs> Tells me that he went back into the bed at 3 o'clock in the morning only to wake up at 5 to screaming children. <laughs> and in order for me to talk to him, I've got to talk to him after bedtime because him and Heidi are wrangling the hornets. So if I look to Pastor Kevin, who's been with me since I've been in this church, 25 years of ministry in this church next May, as my primary source of edification. If I look to Rachel as my primary source of comfort when I'm going through the storms, can I tell you something about my wife? She can't stay up. She needs like seven to eight hours of sleep. There'll be times when I'm just like, you know, I'm distraught and I'm sitting there and I'm like, all right, Kevin can't talk to me because he's sleeping in his recliner. I said, well, I got to talk to Rachel and she starts talking to me. And then all of a sudden, I'm talking, I was like, you really don't understand, because this, and then all of a sudden, she's passed out. <laughs> Do you, and I, I say this not to, not to throw her under the bus, although you should say you should be there more for your husband. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Drink some Red Bull. No, I'm just kidding. Here's the deal. If Jesus is not my primary source, my wife will never fulfill the need that Jesus was meant to fill. My best friend will not be able to fulfill the need that Jesus was meant to fill. You will not be able to fulfill the need that Jesus was meant to fill. Because guess what? There, Billy and Mary Peake sit right here, right? Every first service, 815, and they have kept me in the ministry. Billy is from Tennessee. Mary is from I don't know where, but she's fantastic. And they're in their 80s. And they come up to me every Sunday for a hug. And I could preach the world's worst message. But to them, it's like, Pastor, that was the greatest message in the world. We love you. We're praying for you. Can I have my hug? 25 years of ministry. Thank God for them. But what do I do when they serve in kids' church? And they're not here to tell me. It was a good message, or that I was obedient to deliver the word that God has called me to deliver. 
you got to understand your validation, your comfort, and your security. And I want you to take it out of my realm, and I want you to put it into your realm. How do you know you're living the way God wants you to live? How do you know you're on mission? How do you know that you're doing the right thing? How do you know your affirmation? Because everybody wants to know that they've been doing right. Everybody wants to pat on the back. Everybody wants to know that they're, they're you, know, you understand what I'm saying? You can't depend on people. You must depend on abiding in the private place. Because if you don't, you're sunk. If you abide in him and in his word, the Bible says, ask whatever you want in my name and it will be given to you. Do you know what abiding in his word does? It changes your will to his will. You ain't asking for a Lexus and a yacht and Ric Flair drip. You're asking in line with the word of God. And when you're in line with the word of God, You're praying the will of God, and that's why things come, because you're not praying your will, you're praying his will. I want you to think this week, all week, of David, playing the harp, no matter who thought what of him, no matter how much he was minimized, he was playing the harp. He learned the beauty of abiding in the presence of the Lord. 